station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Seeker, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Julian Huguet with Seeker. How do you hear me? Station, this is Julian Huguet with Seeker. How do you hear me? Station, this is Julian Huguet with Seeker. How do you hear me? Okay, standing by. Station, this is Julian Huguet with Seeker. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. Excellent. Good to be here. Uh, that's already the coolest sentence I've ever said. So, gentlemen, we are doing a piece on the ISS, the station itself. It's past, present, future. And... Uh, it looks like you're floating around, but just to prove that we're really interviewing you in space, can one of you do a backflip or something like that? Uh, we can do a couple things for you. Oh, this is excellent. Just another day at the office. Uh, so thank you so much again for talking to us. Again, this is about the ISS itself. And uh, I understand both of you have a personal history with the ISS. Shane, your first space flight was to the station in 2008. And on that mission, you delivered a new bathroom, a kitchen, and two bedrooms to the station. So I assume in your neighborhood, you have home improvement bragging rights over everybody. Uh, what's it been like to actually see the station grow and to build some of it with your own hands? Yeah, you're right. That was a, a while ago when all that new equipment came up back then. Um, and during our, that short mission, it was only about 10 days we were attached to the space station for that mission. So we really just delivered the equipment and hooked some of it up, but we didn't get the, the chance to utilize any of it. So on my last mission and on this mission, it's been great to actually be able to use those things, uh, use the gym we brought up as well and other systems. So it's been really great to see the station grow uh, and kind of mature over these last couple of decades. And uh, to be a small part of that is pretty cool. So, Tama, your first visit was more recent in 2016. Uh, the station had basically taken on the shape that it has today. When you were first approaching the station in the Soyuz spacecraft and you saw it in its entirety for the first time, what did that feel like? Uh, it felt like I was in a in a science fiction movie. It felt like Star Wars, uh, you know, when they get to the Death Star, like this huge, big, all those huge, big battleships that float in space. That's what it felt like. Cause the Soyuz is pretty tiny. Uh, I mean, it's one and a half tons that come back to Earth, but still, you get to the station. I remember seeing the solar rays from the corner of my eyes from the side, uh, the side window on the space station, and that, that seemed so far away. And then I could see the the entire structure of the ISS. It really felt unreal. Like it's a feat of engineering. Like something so big so complex really actually does exist in space and that shocked me and it got real for the first time when I when I got this view on my first flight that's unbelievable I imagine there's nothing like seeing it up close but you know we have to settle down here for you guys being a couple hundred miles away uh, you guys said you know the station's station's been taking shape over 
decades, really. And I'm curious, how do you make all this technology work? You know, you've got stuff from the late 90s and stuff you're adding today. How do you make it all talk to each other and keep functioning? Yeah, thank goodness we have a great team on the ground that really kind of manages all that stuff. But, you know, you would think we'd have the latest and greatest technology, but honestly, as robust as, as most of the equipment has to be and the testing process it has to go through, we're just by default not going to have the latest and greatest. But we have some really good stuff. Like we just installed some new solar arrays on a couple of spacewalks, to mine and I did, that are really boosting the energy of the space station, and it will for, for years to come, which is pretty special to be part of that. Uh, we just recently also upgraded some data and connectivity issues, you know, issues that we had. That's all kind of upgraded now. And a lot of that's not just for our personal use. On computers, but it's the space station and mission control teams around the world can send data back and forth and make sure that we're, you know, keeping the space station where we're supposed to be in the right orbit and in the right attitude and orientation and those sort of things. So, uh, we, I would say we are relevant and we're current. We're not certainly the latest and greatest in technology, unfortunately, for us, but uh, that's just the way it is. But uh, we've been doing that for again many decades, and uh, it's proven to be a great system. Again, bragging rights in your neighborhood for home improvement. If anybody's putting solar panels on, you can just say, ah, yeah, I remembered when I installed some panels in space. So the ISS is only possible because of cooperation between five space agencies and 15 countries. And Tama, you're an astronaut from an agency that is a, itself a collaboration of several nations. So what do you think the significance is of this global effort that's required to keep a handful of humans in orbit? I think it's pretty significant. I think, well, first of all, you realize that everything that's ambitious now, it happens at an international level and we need cooperation. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do ambitious things such as, you know, send humans to uh, uh, to the moon, send humans to Mars uh, without international cooperation. So we'll need everybody to unite and to contribute something to a common endeavor, that's one. And then second, it's obviously not easy, you know, to, to, to agree because um, people are different, obviously, even for us within Europe, uh, we have to agree on, you know, anything before before we bring it up to the, the ISS partnership. So that's that's two levels um, of reaching an agreement. That's, that's not easy, but what it does, I think, is it forces you to focus on the things you have in common rather to focus on, on your differences. And that's great. And that's what we need. That's why we need, you know, corporations like the ISS that are hugely visible for everybody to see. And so that it forces the countries to, to contribute. It's very, very easy to disagree. Uh, people are different all over the planet. Everybody has their own interest and priority. It's not always easy to cooperate. Operate. So we need to we need to be an example for this. We need to set an example, and we need to force people to think about what they have in common rather than their differences. And that's what the ISS does every day. I love that. Uh, so the ISS obviously is a testament to this collaboration. It's an incredible engineering project, but it's also a real working lab where you guys are doing science every day, or you know whatever you call a day when you see 16 sunsets every 24 hours. But what are some ways on pe that people on Earth have actually felt the contributions of the ISS and maybe haven't realized it? You know, for the past couple of decades, uh, we've been producing, we, NASA and the International Partnership have been producing incredible results that are helping people on Earth. Um, the, I think the quickest way to, to, to look at some of those is to go to NASA spinoffs and just Google that, and you'll see hundreds and hundreds of ways that uh, experiments that we've done up here have helped people on Earth. A couple of the ones that we've worked on recently that, uh, you know, I, I kind of like are one, uh, we do a lot of medical research up here, and we're just, you know, we're partnered with the researchers and we, we help them out with their data. One of the ones that we've done recently is worked with uh, the du Duquesne's muscular dystrophy and some of the protein crystal growths that we've had on board the space station have proven to be a treatment for that. Uh, and now they're, I think, phase three clinical trials now. Um, and it looks like it can reduce, you know, about half uh, or it can slow down about uh, the growing potential for that by half. So that's going to, you know, prolong pe people's life that have that disease. That's pretty special to be involved in things like that. Other things that we really get involved in are taking pictures of planet Earth and natural disasters um, that happen, you know, all over our planets, unfortunately, but wildfires and uh, hurricanes and things recently that we've been able to photograph with cameras from the inside of the space station with us taking the picture as well as cameras on the outside. So we can help the first responders. We can help, you know, other uh, weather agencies in those kind of situations predict things and, and help other people on the ground. That's incredible. Uh, 
you kind of beat me to my next question, but I'll direct it to Tama, which is, do you have any particular favorite experiments that you have participated in or witnessed aboard the space station? Yeah, like Shane said, there's a, there's a lot of experiments happening every day in a lot of different domains, which is also what's fascinating. You're going to do fluid physics one day, you're going to do medicine or biology uh, the next day. So, so that's that's pretty special for us every day. Um, I think one that we actually really like that's uh, ongoing right now in that very module, uh, it's called Plant Habitat 4, and we're, we're growing some plants on board the space station. Um, because when we, when we venture further and deeper into space, we'll need to be able to grow our own food. Uh, so we have to study this on board the space station. Station. And by doing so, we also identify how to make plants maybe more uh, more resistant to, to difficult conditions where water is scarce, when they're, they're liking what they usually get from the natural environment. Because as you can imagine up here, um, it's, it's actually difficult. There's no soil. You have to water the plant. It's, everything becomes much more complicated. But nevertheless, uh, we were able to, with the help from the scientists, to grow some uh, the red hatch chili peppers that are actually really good looking. We haven't tasted them yet, um, but we like to look at them. We like to interact with them because it also reminds us of nature on the ground. There's not so many natural elements around us on board the space station, but this is one and that's why everybody likes it. Uh, speaking of everything is more complicated up there, I asked social media if they had any questions for you, and I'm sure this is going to come as no surprise, but about half the questions involved, how do you go to the bathroom? Now, normally I wouldn't ask, you know, we're serious for realsies science journalists, but I happen to know that you guys are installing a new toilet on the ISS. So I guess I have to ask, how's the new toilet treating you? That's a great question. And the, the new toilet is called the Universal Waste Management System. And the universal really is key there because we want to not just use it here. We're using it as a test bed here on the station, but we're going to use it on future missions to, uh, that are going to the moon and maybe even to Mars. But it's going well. We've been testing it out for one week now, uh, and I've been the sole tester. Um, so uh, <laughs> things are going pretty well with that. Uh, and, you know, and it's great. The upgrade is kind of a, you know, it's smaller overall, smaller and lighter, which is great. Um, and so we reduced the system almost by over half actually um, with the whole thing that if you look at the toilet side by side with the current toilet um, it looks bigger but the whole overall system is much smaller so we figured out a way to do that which we're going to need if we're going to go in a smaller capsule like we're intending to go to the moon here in the next few years uh, well that is exactly where i was uh, going with that so i'm glad you brought it up because really i want to get to what's in the future for space stations in general. And the Artemis program uh, is gearing up to send humans back to the moon. And part of that is a, a lunar station called Gateway. So these uh, agencies, the Japanese, Canadian, European, and NASA are all gonna partner again. What lessons from the ISS can they take to Gateway? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic because um, today all the, the major space agencies in the world have the same goal and they're working in common to achieve the same goal, which has never happened before, I think, to my knowledge. Um, so I honestly think we'll get there in in no time. Um, and really, the point is is to go to the moon, but in a more uh, sustainable, in a more permanent way than than uh, NASA did um, in the in the seventies. Uh, because the, the point is to establish a common presence. It's always the same, it's always the same pattern. Um, you send an explorer or explorers, you try to learn about the environment, then you settle and you try to have people live there and then you develop. And it's, it has always happened like this on the, on the globe, on the planet. Um, and it has happened like this for uh, low Earth orbit. We've, we've now been living, astronauts have been living for more than 20 years uh, in low Earth orbit permanently. So now we've kind of mastered this environment. It's a big work, it's still very difficult, but we're planning to repeat the same pattern on the moon. We've had explorers go to the moon, and now we want to go and stay. And then we'll send explorers to Mars, and then we'll go and stay. Um, and part of that process is to learn how to make that happen. That's what we do every day on ISS. We're doing science that benefits the people on the ground, like we talked about before, but we're also doing exploration. We're trying to improve the technology. We're trying to improve the processes. We're trying to learn about the human body in space for extended periods of time. Uh, and all this that we're doing every day is going to enable us to go to the moon, uh, go to Mars. Shane mentioned the solar arrays, the toilet, the, uh, generally speaking, the life support system, all the systems that are going to be needed to, to take that major next step. We're testing them, we're establishing them, uh, we're learning about them on the space station today. 
So with Gateway planned in the future, what do you think is in store for the ISS? Yeah, ISS is going to be around for a while. Um, we certainly hope so. Um, I think you're going to see a bigger commercial aspect of it over the next decade or so, which is you know, really what we hope to do, uh, make it uh, more accessible to commercial companies to be able to use. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out. I think that's the, that's the plan, at least from what I've heard. Um, as we kind of take that next step to, uh, with the Artemis program going to the moon, uh, we'll, we may still have a presence here in low Earth orbit, but in general, we want to move out and let the commercial companies and private companies maybe take over low Earth orbit. So this is my final question, uh, and it's for both of you. It's kind of big picture, stepping back and taking a look at things as a whole. And I want to ask each of you, uh, in terms of you know the entire story of the human race as a species, where do you think the ISS fits into that? That's a great question, and and once again, I think it I think it's significant, maybe more than people realize. Uh, the ISS is the time when. Uh, humans in general stopped being bond to, to Earth and they, they started to be a multi, not multi-planetary, but not strictly on one planet species. Like I said, we've been, we've had humans live in space for 20 years. Um, so now part of humanity is not only strictly on Earth, but also in space. Um, and the first step of this is really the ISS. That's the ISS, that, that big permanent space station that enables us to live in space. So the ISS is pretty significant because, you know, you know, 100 years when hopefully maybe the human beings are on other planets, then you'll look back um, and you'll, you'll look at the ISS as the starting point of this. That's the time when humans freed themselves up from the cradle of the Earth and started really venturing to space to live, not just to see what it's like and come back. Thank you. Shane, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, just to add on a kind of a different side of things is if you think about the engineering that was involved in creating the station for one, but then you know, all these different countries that were involved that had to have pieces that put, you know, this module had to fit to an American module, which had to fit to a European module, and none of that was ever put together on planet Earth, right? So just things like that, and it, it just amazes me how um, these incredible engineers and scientists got together, created this plan, and it works so well. Um, um, at that level. So that's pretty neat, I think, overall as well, um, when you think about where this fits in. Um, it's an engineering marvel for one. Um, it's an incredible place to do world-class research, which is what it's completely designed for, and we're in that research phase, and we have been the last several years. So uh, it's really special, and uh, who knows, you know, 100 years from now, like Tomas said, hopefully we'll look back and see how really important the International Space Station has been to our planet. Well, uh, Tomas, Shane, thank you both so much. I don't have any more questions for either of you. I'd ask if you want to hang out, but I'm sure you have uh, important science to get back to, so I'll let you go. All right, great talking to you today, and thanks for joining us on the space station. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from Seeker. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.